Right, so thank you very much. Last talk of the day, I'm going to talk about the arts of putting things on the screen, basically. Um, so I'm talking about incorporating visuals, graphics, and things like that into our Angular applications. And of course, when we do that, we usually use HTML and CSS, because that's by far the most versatile and sort of uh, general purpose way to do it. But it's really just one of the four major rendering pipelines that we have in the browser, because there's also SVG, which can also be styled with CSS. There's Canvas for 2D graphics, and there's WebGL Canvas for 3D graphics. Now, today I'm going to concentrate on two of these uh, in particular, which are SVG and Canvas, which are kind of the two ways to do two-dimensional visuals. And of course, there are sort of many reasons why you may end up needing one or the other of these. Some examples from my own work recently. I've been working on this kind of tree visualization thing. I'm not going to go into what it's about, but it's basically this interactive way to explore this kind of tree space which is an example of something where SVG really shines because it, cuts, it has lots of shapes and curves and things like that. That's really easy to do, actually, with SVG, but really hard to do with something like HTML. Some other things that I've been doing this year, I've done a bunch of these kind of uh, music visualization things that use the canvas to, to draw things on the screen and synchronize that with sounds that are being produced with, with web audio. So that's something where, where canvas is really handy on the other hand. And of course, there's a co whole world of different kinds of things where you might need uh, SVG or Canvas, ranging from animated icons to all kinds of data visualization, charts and maps and things like that, to, to full-blown you know, games, for example, and other artistic uh, things. All of these can be done in the browser and have been done, done in the browser, and all of this we can also do in Angular. So let's talk about doing these kinds of graphics in Angular. And let's talk about SVG first, because that's arguably the more common of these two. So SVG is a markup language, just like HTML. But whereas in HTML we do like divs and paragraphs and text fields, in SVG we do actual visual shapes, things that uh, are these kind of visual primitives that the SVG language provides, which we can use in our markup, and then combine to do uh, visual scenes of any kind of complexity. So we can do things like the Angular logo. So Igor said today we can play with the logo, and that's exactly what I'm going to do today. So we can draw the logo using three SVG shapes, two polygons for two different halves of the shield, and then a path for the A. So say we wanted to draw this in an Angular view, we would probably have this SVG somewhere, which is the SVG root tag, and then these three shapes uh, defined inside it. If we want to put this in an Angular component, we can actually do just that. We can just drop it inside a template and it'll just work. So there's nothing much to it on that simple level. So it just works there because HTML allows embedding SVGs into it, and Angular also allows that. But once you start working with this a little bit more, you will run into situations where it's not quite this straightforward. And uh, so th and that all has to do with sort of differences between SVG DOM and HTML DOM as the browsers implement them. Because one thing to know about these templates that we use in our components is that they always get compiled by Angular to actual JavaScript code that then dynamically produces those elements at runtime. So when we have stuff like this in the view, what actually gets executed are things like this, the document create element, and things like that for each of those elements that we have. And the thing about this is that there are different APIs in the browser for SVG and HTML. You can't create an element in the same way between these two. And that means that Angular needs to know what we are talking about when we have an element in our template, because it needs to know which one of these two it should use. Now, in that simple case that I just showed, Angular can kind of infer that from the fact that the SVG root tag is in the same template, and it can kind of know, okay, this is SVG. But this is no longer going to be true when you have your SVGs uh, divided up into m multiple components. So that's when you start to uh, need to start to get ex explicit about this. And we can do that by adding this namespace prefix in, in those SVG tags. This essentially lets Angular know that this is an SVG path and not something else. And uh, I kind of have a rule in my own 
stuff to always use that prefix whenever I'm doing SVG, regardless of whether it's actually necessary in that case or not, because it just make things, makes things a lot clearer and uh, won't, won't trip me up later. So that's one thing. Another thing with SVG that comes up is sooner or later you want to start to make things dynamic. So instead of having hard-coded uh, attributes in your templates, you want to kind of bind them to expressions that calculate your, your things at runtime so you can make dynamic visuals. And the way we usually do that, of course, is to just put square brackets around the properties to bind things into them. But with SVG, this also is not going to work just like that. And that's because this will compile down to something like this in when Angular actually compiles it. It's actually going to set the value of that expression to that D property on that path element. And the problem with this is that there is no D element on the path, a D property on the path element, because SVG in general does not provide properties for attributes. Uh, it only provides the attributes themselves. And in practice, what this means is that you'll need to call this, or someone needs to call this set attribute method on that element to actually make that work. So, so there is no property you can set, you have to call this method. And again, this is something that we kind of need to give Angular a hint about, that it should do the second thing and not the first. And there we use another prefix, actually, in, in our template. We say adder dot whatever we're setting to, to kind of make that at set attribute a method get called. And uh, this is something we kind of have to do with most of the things in SVG. It's not needed for, I think, class and style and ID, but pretty much everything else needs to be set this way. So that's number two. Number three is when you start to divide this stuff into components, which is going to be sooner or later, we, we define these components in Angular and then we use them as custom elements in our templates. But this is also something that's not going to fly when you're in SVG land because you will have noticed that when you use these custom elements, you end up having custom elements in your runtime DOM in the browser. And when you are in HTML, that's just fine, because HTML is processed in a certain way by the browsers, that they have a, have a well-defined way, what, uh, approach to unknown elements. That's not true for SVG. When, when you're having SVG, the browser is not going to know what to do with these unknown tags. So it's not going to render them, at least Chrome won't. So it's, that's a problem, and we, we're going to have to find another approach to make components. And that we can find if we go back to how we actually define these components, and especially that selector that we use for matching these components with elements, because that selector doesn't actually have to be an element selector. It can be some other CSS selector as well, including an attribute selector. So if we just put square brackets around that, we're making it use the CSS syntax, selector syntax for attributes. And that means that now this component can be used with any, com any element that has the app logo left attribute on it. And that includes any element, including standard SVG elements. So now I can use the standard G or group element to define components, and I don't have to have those unknown elements in my SVG DOM if I want to use components. But that's pretty much all about SVG. SVG is a very good fit for Angular. It's kind of, you can use it wherever you use HTML, and you can put it inside components, you can bind data to it, you can add event listeners, you can divide it into components. You can do all the things you can with HTML if you just follow these kind of three rules that all are caused by the fact that the DOM implementation in browsers is different. But other than that, it, it'll just generally work. And this brings us to Canvas then, which is, well, a different beast entirely. Um, so in Canvas, there is no markup. There's no declarative markup syntax. There's just an imperative JavaScript API with method calls with which we can draw things. So it's a very different API, and one kind of useful way to, to distinguish between SVG and Canvas is that SVG is a so-called retained rendering mode, whereas Canvas is an immediate rendering mode. And what that means is that when we want to put a circle on the screen, we can do that with either of these very easily. And with SVG, what we do is we just use a circle element in our template, and the browser will make a circle appear on the screen. But what it will also do is it will create an actual circle object, an SVG circle element object that's going to be retained in memory that represents that circle. 
which we can later use to maybe set the attributes on it to make the circle move around or attach event listeners on it so if you want to make it respond to clicks. All kinds of things are possible with that. But none of that is going to happen with Canvas, because in Canvas, when you draw a circle, you'll get a circle on the screen, but there's not going to be a circle object. If we want to move it around, we have to draw other circles on the Canvas. If we want to listen to events, we can't do it on the circle, we have to do it on the whole Canvas. So it's a much more restri restrictive and low-level API. But on the other hand, it uh, can be a lot more resource-friendly API, because there's no need for, browser for the browser to keep this this object graph in memory to, to kind of manage that for all the shapes that we draw. It can just manage that single pixel buffer, and that means we can do a lot more with the canvas. And we can do maybe something like this then, which is again drawing the Angular logo, but instead of using three shapes for it, using 50,000 little points. And uh, arguably you could do this in SVG as well, but but something tells me that if you use 50,000 DOM elements for your logo, it's going to lead to trouble at some point. With Canvas, you can just do that. It's no problem, which kind of shows the difference in resource usage here. So if we want to put a Canvas in an Angular component, we'll first of all use one, define a Canvas tag in a component template. And we'll use one of these reference variables, these hashtags, that give it, <coughs> give it a name that we can use to refer to that Canvas object. And then in the component class, we can use the view child decorator to actually inject in that reference to that DOM node into the component class, because that will give us access to the actual native DOM API of the Canvas, which we can then use to draw on it, which I'm doing here from the ng on init lifecycle hook. So that's how, that's how you can kind of put a canvas inside a component and draw on it. Though usually when you have a canvas, you don't just draw on it once. You want to draw on it whenever something happens to make it kind of respond to different states of your application. So maybe you could do something like this, which still draw, draws 50,000 points, but it's 50,000 different points 10 times every second to kind of make it simulate a situation where there's changing data in the application. Now, the way I usually do this is by, well, first of all, having that data that the Canvas component should draw come in as an input to the component, as a regular component input, and then I use the onChanges hook to actually draw. So I implement onChanges, and in onChanges what I do is I clear the Canvas from whatever was there previously and draw the new scene. So that this kind of makes the components a well-behaving Angular component in the sense that you can bind data to it and it will always draw the latest data that it has. And whoever's using the component doesn't have to necessarily know that there's a canvas inside it because it behaves as you would expect. And that's, that's how you can do canvas. So it's not quite as natural as SVG because it, there's no markup that you can use in templates, but you can still put one inside a component and, and then just uh, draw on it from, from the component classes lifecycle hooks. So that's how you can draw things, but then we should talk about how to make these things move as well, because motion is very important in, in applications these days. And Well, with SVG, there's kind of several ways to, to animate. Uh, the most powerful API that exists for SVG animation in the standards is something called Smile, that actually lets you uh, define XML tags in, in within your SVG that defines animations for your, for your shapes. This is a very powerful, very versatile, very deprecated API, which actually uh, was never implemented by IE or Edge um, and has been deprecated by cr the Chrome team, for example. Just, they have said that they're going to pull it out. So that kind of makes it a non-starter. So what we're left with then is essentially CSS. So because CSS transitions and animations can be used with SVG, it's a little bit more restrictive, though, because uh, with CSS, you can only animate things that you can actually style in CSS. And with SVG, you can style things like colors and opacities and transforms, but not other things like the actual coordinates or the points of your shapes. So, and those other things you can't then animate using CSS either, because you can't style them from, from CSS. But you can still do a lot of things like, for example, attach different keyframe animations to the different shapes that you have in the Angular logo which I'm doing here. And the nice thing about that is that you can do it exactly like you do in HTML, so there's no difference really how you use this stuff. You just define keyframes in your 
component style sheet and then attach them to, to your SVG elements, for example, using CSS classes. And the CSS and Smile, but there's also now this kind of third emerging standard for animating things, which is web animations. And that's really interesting for SVG as well, because um, one of the expressed goals of that standard is to unify CSS and SVG animations. It's kind of meant to be a replacement for Smile. And what makes it doubly interesting for all of us in this room is that it happens to be the underlying engine behind Angular's animations. And that means we can use ng-animate with SVG. So that kind of brings it closer to our actual application states. We can do enter and exit, and we can do kind of transitions tied into actual data in the components, which is something I'm doing here. And uh, again, we can use this actually exactly like we do uh, with HTML. So I'm not going to get into, into this too much, but we do exactly what we do with HTML, which is to add these animation triggers in our component metadata and then attach them to elements using the ng-animate binding syntax. And that'll generally just work. But this still has an issue, which is that we still can't do things like this. So this is an example of a pa shape morphing animation, where I'm actually changing the points of these polygons and animating them between two different points. And this is something you can do with Smile, but not with CSS nor with web animations. So we are in an unfortunate situation where there's a deprecated standard that can do more than the non-deprecated ones, which is unfortunate, but you know, it's just the way it is, as far as I can tell. And that leaves us with essentially JavaScript for this kind of stuff, or rather, usually, third-party libraries that do this stuff for us. What I'm using here is GreenSock, and that's kind of the leading contender here, a very kind of venerable, uh, fast, superheroic uh, animation library that works really well and can also be used with Angular. So the way GreenSock works is that you hand it over your DOM element and some configuration, and it will then figure out how to animate that. And you can use it both with SVG and HTML. So with Angular, what we do is we can again use these reference variables to, to uh, give names to those DOM elements that we actually want to, to animate. And I've forgotten the SVG prefix here, it seems. Um, but then we can inject those in as view children and then hand them over to GreenSock and it'll then uh, handle the animations. And it's quite not quite as nice as something like ng-animate because it's not quite as declarative and you do need kind of the raw DOM access level for this, but it's not that bad either. And to be honest, you may want to use something like GreenSock even if you're not doing sophisticated animations because there are browser inconsistencies in how SVG transforms and transitions are handled and you may get different results on different browsers if you use these standard animations and Libraries like GreenSock will kind of try to iron those out for you. So that's another reason why something like GreenSock will, might be useful. But those are essentially our options. CSS is there, ng-animate is there, but if both of those fall short because of these standard kind of uh, um, restrictions, GreenSock and other libraries are, are available as well. And finally then, animating canvas. So we already saw how drawing on a canvas is a completely different thing than drawing SVGs. And the same is true for canvas, none of which, none of the stuff I just said applies to canvas at all. Um, instead, we kind of have to drop to the level of drawing actual individual animation frames like this, uh, this person is doing here for Bugs Bunny, where we, if we want to make a shape move, we have to, have to actually draw it a hundred times for each of those uh, intermediate states. And the main tool for that we have is, is request animation frame, which is probably familiar for most of us here, a uh, function that lets us attach a callback to the browser paint uh, pipeline. So we can tell the browser, next time you paint, can you also please run this function because I also want to paint something. And that's when we usually do our canvas drawing. And the nice thing about that is that we can easily kind of build a loop on top of that. So we can make this function that will paint a frame and then schedule itself to be called again in the next animation frame. And what, what we have essentially here is a loop, a asynchronous loop that will be executed however fast the browser is able to keep painting, which is going to be typically up to 60 times per second. And, and in there, we then draw our individual frames. So we can do something like this with that. So this is a swarm of, of Angular logos or something. So this is a, an example of something that's really good for Canvas because, well, first of all, there's a lot of stuff going on here. 
there should be a lot of dumb nonsense if it was SVG. But secondly, it's a real-time simulation where we actually don't know where these things are going until we've calculated each frame. So with web animations, there would be nothing for us to give the web animations API because we don't know where each of these is going to be one second from now. So we have to use request animation frame for stuff like this. So if you want to set an animation loop for something like this up in Angular, um, what I usually do is I set up these on init and on destroy hooks in the component, in my canvas component, where I'm maintaining this Boolean flag that is going to be true as long as the component hasn't been destroyed yet. And then from on init, I also launch the first paint. So that's going to start the main paint routine. And that paint method is then kind of what gets called over and over. And it has three steps in it. It first checks if the component is still on the screen, and then it paints on the screen, and then it schedules itself to be called again. So this is the same animation loop that I, I had there earlier, but this time in an Angular component. And that paint code there, which I've omitted mostly, is, is going to get a bit complex in these cases, because with the request animation frame, you need to kind of calculate how much time has passed from the pa last frame and where all the, your objects should be at that point. So there's a lot of manual code in there which has nothing to do with Angular, it's just the way this kind of animation works. But it's some, just something you have to do sometimes. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be slow, it's just, you know, labors for, for us to code. Now there is one Angular-specific thing about this, though, which has to do with change detection. Because, well, you may know that Angular has this concept of, of zones, and the Angular zone, which kind of works so that whenever anything happens in your application, your code runs in the ng zone, and when it's done, Angular automatically will run change detection for you. And that's good usually because we don't have to think about change detection until you have a paint loop, because this also happens for request animation frame, which means you may end up running change detection up to 60 times each second. And the thing about paint loops is that usually we are not changing things inside them, so there's no need reason for this to occur. And you know, however fast Angular's change detection is going to be, you probably don't want to do it 60 times per second if you don't have to. Um, so luckily, there's a quick way out of this, which is to take that paint loop outside the Angular zone, which we can do by injecting the ng zone object to our component and then scheduling our first paint to run outside the Angular zone. That's going to take it outside where it's not going to cause change detection to happen anymore. And because of the way zones work, none of the subsequent animation frames will be in the Angular zone either. It's this simple thing is going to take the whole thing outside of the zone, which is almost always what you want to do for these things. So in summary, we have these two APIs, SVG and Canvas for 2D graphics, both of which work with Angular. SVG is arguably easier because it kind of works kind of like HTML and works with the components really well. There are just a few things we need to remember when we work with it based on you know, dumb stuff. Canvas is also there, which we can kind of put inside a component and then, then just draw, hide, hide it inside a component and draw on it from that component's lifecycle hooks. And when we want to move these things around, we can use CSS, we can use ng-animate, or we can use third-party libraries, which is often actually preferable. And for Canvas, there's really nothing but a request animation frame, but that can easily be set up in a loop inside a component. And uh, we just need to remember to do it outside the ng zone unless there's a very good reason to, to stay inside. Everything I just showed, all those code examples are in this Git repo. So if you want to reference something, you'll find it there. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you.